Bright Red Tracer 9. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is while you're watching this and you're joining me from the top box of my Tracer 9 in the Elam Valley in Wales. This was going to be a 10,000 mile review but a combination of sunny days which have been unusual lately in the UK and needing to check out a route saw me heading west to Wales and a lovely day it was as well, at least for the first six hours and we'll look at the Tracer seat in a bit. You can see that as well as being bright red, my Tracer 9 is the standard, not the GT version. It has the CP3 engine, a triple 890cc, putting out 117 horsepower and 69 foot-pounds of torque. The chassis, strangely, has a rake angle of 25 degrees, which seems quite shallow these days compared to a lot of other bikes. The on-the-road weight is 213 kilos, and this also includes a full fuel tank of 18.7 litres. You can see here that the angle of the fuel tank means that a single glove can't be stuck under the fuel cap when you open it to stop your tank being scratched, so one on top of the other, starting at the seat, and there you go. The lights have changed position from the previous tracer where they were integrated into the running lights just under the screen that you can see here. They've now moved down to just above the radiator. Starting the engine brings the dipped one on and then of course you have the high beam as well. Rear lights are a lot better than the Mark 1 tracer where they just appear to be a single LED either side uh, into these two small clusters which are a lot brighter and the brake light is certainly bright enough to be noticed. Talking of the brakes, the calipers are the Yamaha Silver Dot variety Variety. and as you can see here the front and rear pads have still got a lot of life left on them after over 11,000 miles. The tyres are Bridgestone T32s. They seem okay, um, they're good in the dry. I'm not fully confident on them in the wet. The front tyre valve weirdly is placed between two of the spokes. I don't know if this is a requirement of how they're made but I would certainly hope so rather than it being a design feature because it's a bit of a pig to get at but if you look at the rear one it's offset from the rear spokes quite away so it's a lot easier to get the pressure gauge and pump onto when you're checking your tyre pressures. The front tyre will last between 9 and 10,000 miles. Mine hadn't quite worn down to the wear indicators at 9.5 but that's when I got it changed and the rear tyre should see you between 7 and 8,000 miles. Although I'm on my third rear tyre because I got a puncture at 900 miles then another one at about 3,000 miles so this is the first chance I've had to see how long a rear tyre will last. The chain that lasts well if you look after it. The first adjustment I made was about 2,000 miles but in the last couple of thousand miles I've been having to adjust it quite regularly so it's due for replacement and if you look at these rear sprocket teeth they're starting to get chipped so you can expect about 12,000 miles out of one of these. If you remember this scene from the classic film Airplane, you're going to understand how I felt when I first sat on the Tracer. There's a lot of controls. The left hand cluster has quite a lot on them. You move across via the double instrument panel which uh, lights up with a plethora of information to the right hand side. Now one thing I would do here is change the run to fun with a little bit of white paint. I think that would make it quite amusing but then I don't get out much. The instruments do look like everybody's favourite Pixar robot of Wally but I'd really like an option to turn these into a couple of clocks rather than a, a strange bar graph and digital miles an hour readout. As you would expect with a modern bike for modern audiences, you get a mode switch on the Tracer. So let's have a look at the four engine modes and the difference between them. Henry, the mild-mannered janitor. Rosemary, the telephone operator. Sarge. There is a mode button on the bike, rather annoyingly it's on the trigger on your left hand where you'd have your high beam flash. If you squeeze this it changes the mode you can change from the drive mode or the engine mode to TCS mode which has got 1-2 and manual and there we go you change back again. Looking at the controls, even with size 9 hands, or at least that's the rubber glove size that I wear when I'm doing anything on the bike or in a lab, 
I have to lift my hands off the handlebars to even work the indicators. And as for the high and low beam, I live in a country area and what I do on my other three bikes is leave my thumb resting gently on top of the high low beam select so I can quickly switch to low beam if a vehicle comes the other way. But you can see here how far my hand's having to come off the handlebars to work the controls. The cruise control, I virtually have to take my hands off the handlebars to engage it and uh, set or resume the cruising speed. Moving or pressing the wheel lets you select one of the four quadrants of the right hand display and change it. So you select it on the rolling the thumb wheel, press it in to turn it white and then you can actually change between 11 different sets of information that you could uh, want on the bike. I tend to leave it in the trip 1, trip 2, average fuel consumption and coolant temperature mode. Um, if I was going to change one it would be the average fuel consumption that's the one that I'd least need to use on a regular basis. The left hand display also lets you select four of the options on here, more if you've got the electronic suspension. You can change the auto to exactly the same 11 modes as you can the fuel gauge. If you put this in track mode you also get your lap time information but annoyingly you have to flash the headlights to start the lap timer going. If you move down onto the bottom two you actually get the control for the heated grips and this is integrated which is really nice. If you select it and leave it selected you can actually just use the thumb wheel to change the heated grip settings from 0 to 10 and 10 is like putting your hands in lava it's really quite toasty. You also have the settings displayed by the usual gear wheel which we're all used to on our computers these days and there's various bits and pieces in here all covered in the manual um, shift indicators, units, brightness, everything else including reset everything Maintenance gives you the miles from when the bike was last serviced, at least by a Yamaha dealer who can reset it. And these are the heated grips, they're very nice and very integrated. The thing I find with this, as in the left hand handlebar, is quite a stretch to get to the selection wheel. And remember, this is your throttle hand. It's also quite difficult to accurately press to select something, so I wouldn't recommend using this on the road. I'd set it onto whatever I needed to, use it to engage the heated grips if I need to, and then leave it. The original screen is shown here it's very large and weirdly when I was test riding a Tracer 9 whichever position I had this set in it would batter my head so I changed it for a smaller screen that makes it feel like a naked bike but for this film I put the screen back on and weirdly I didn't get wind buffeting at least not with the screen in the higher position in the lower position up to about 50 miles an hour it was fine then I'd need to put it into the higher position but it's also quite easy to change did I mention the bike is very 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 red and I think I might need to get myself some Royal Mail King Charles insignia made up for the bike because it does look like I'm delivering post on it going back to the front and underneath the very red did I mention it's very red side panels you get the aero kit it's these two little winglets i'm not sure if they do much good there must be some benefit to them but i don't think i've ever felt it pootling around at 70 miles an hour moving up above the lights we have what looks like an intake there's one on either side and hopefully this does go somewhere to like the top of the air box to give you a little bit of increased air pressure rather than some of the ones these days that are just there to look pretty and look technical and don't actually do anything there is a cover on the clutch cover if that makes any sense it's plastic it's on top of the metal one well there is a reason for this unlike some design features on bikes these days because you tend to put your leg down right next to the engine when you come to a stop and put your right foot down so this is to stop you your leg and in this case for demonstration purposes only my overalls getting burned the oil filter and sump drain plug are on the front of the engine look like they're going to be easy enough to get to when i come to do my own servicing when the bike's out of warranty and the shock is also quite easily accessible to adjust the preload on it here it's very nearly horizontal between the swing arm and the back of the engine however it does get absolutely coated in muck but we're going to come on to that in a bit at the front of the bike and shown here behind the standard screen is a 12 volt fag lighter type power outlet for all your power needs 
The seat is easily removable, even with the luggage in place. It's a two-part seat, so the first thing you do is take the rear seat off with the key. Then you pull out this funny rubber bung and feel underneath. And what you're looking for is the little tab here. And if you pull that to one side, you release the front part of the seat. Under the seat, you have a battery weirdly laying on its side. You have, in my case, the... Uh, infill part for the seat being in the lower of the two positions. The tongue there goes into the upper position for the seat if you ride it in the higher position. You also have the plate for adjusting the seat, this funny H-shape thing. Again that gives you the high and low seat positions. Fuse box is under here as well. It's quite a squeeze to get it out. It does say push either side but trying to get onto the right hand side of it is a bit um, hard if you've got your thumbs and it does list all the fuses and their positions. I've got another fuse here which is my sat nav and optimate charger lead um, i've covered the sat nav in other places that i use a tamiya connector to plug the sat nav in when i'm not using the charger underneath the pillion seat we have the tool kit which is a screwdriver and an allen key and a little tool pouch within which we have even less tools than you used to be able to get there's a single spanner a uh, suspension adjusting hook spanner and an extension piece that fits over the hook spanner so you can actually get enough leverage to change the preload on the rear shock. Putting the seat back on I used to think you couldn't actually get the front seat on with the rubber piece in place you can you just have to be a little bit brutal with it then it's a case of put the tongue on the front seat in the appropriate place uh, at the bottom of the tank give me a good firm thump to get it back into position and then the rear seat goes on um, underneath the back on a, again a couple of tongues and uh, just give it another good firm push to engage the lock I've got full luggage on my bike. The actual luggage mounting points are quite unobtrusive. Although weirdly, you do have to buy these. You replace one piece of metal with another piece of metal. I thought they could have left those on as standard. You need the key to even attach the luggage, which uh, doesn't happen with Givy sets. They do look quite large, the panniers, but using my test piece of an AVG flip front helmet, it rapidly becomes apparent that you can't fit a full face helmet into the Side case no matter which way round you try to put it it won't let the lid close by an inch or so maybe whichever way you put it I have almost got it closed but it does feel like it's putting an awful lot of pressure on the lid and this is without a cover on the helmet which I'd normally use to stop the helmet getting scratched while it's inside the pannier I'm not sure why they've done this it's very very annoying Another thing is the luggage is a nice funky shape but it's not really that helpful when it comes to being able to stand it up. Uh, a small knock will have it laying over left or right hand side and if you want to stand it up you, the only choices are standing it on the hinges which isn't good because they're plastic and over time they would wear or standing it on the locking mechanism again not a good way of doing it because in time they'll wear the top box does give you a rather funky and friendly looking face and the good news is that when you unlock it you can get a helmet in a helmet this is a 45 litre top box and because of the shape of it you can't actually get to full face flip up helmets in. So this is my AGV test and my off-roading flip up MT helmet storm. Really disappointing. There's a lot of extra bulk on this case with the locking mechanism and you really should be able to get two full face helmets in something to be very careful of and you know, i've used a bit of uh, folded up paper wedged under the locking tongue to show you this is that this little tongue here must engage in the handle when you uh, put the luggage on the bike if it doesn't you could have the handle bounce upwards and disengage the retaining mechanism and your top box goes bouncing off down the road behind you. I only have one helmet in it though, won't it? The issue with this is that when you put your key in to get into your top box, this handle will flip up slightly. If you don't notice it and make sure it's locked when you put everything back in, you can lock the top box but you haven't locked it to the bike securely, so just be careful of this. Again, the top box must either stand on its hinges or on its locking mechanism. Not a terribly good idea. Even cheap Givy luggage will actually let you stand the top box up on its hinges, but the hinges are more protected than on the Yamaha one. Did Getting on to the nitty gritty, the sight glass for the oil is right at the bottom of the engine and annoyingly, if you've got engine bars fitted, pretty much behind one of them. 
the filler cap's also at the bottom of the engine and uh, a few turns lets you take it off. It's so close to the actual side glass. I don't know why this isn't a dipstick, but it's a filler cap. However, being at the bottom of the engine, when you come to try and top your oil up, if you need to, you'll find out that the funnel goes in somewhere like this and you'd pull the oil out all over the floor because of the angle of it. You do need a bit of pipe attached to the bottom of the funnel to be able to fill up the bike. Something I'm not sure about because on my 900 Hornet, which is a over 20 years old design compared to the Tracer, you've got a sight glass and the oil filler cap is on the top of the engine. I think they could have maybe put a little hole in the plastic cover to allow the filler cap to be on the top of the clutch cover and do it that way, but uh, there you go. I think on the front section, maybe about the one o'clock position would be a good place for an oil filler in this case. This is the lambda sensor in the exhaust. You can see the exhaust is going a little bit brown, but uh, still seems to be perfectly okay at the moment. But look at the routing of the wire and where the lambda sensor is. It's in a place that is massively susceptible to anything getting flicked up from the road. The standard tracer mudguard is the red bit. The black bit is a rather large pyramid plastics extender that I've put on and it does keep a lot of the muck off the bottom of the exhaust and also off the lambda sensor and I'd be worried about that being hit by something or possibly even caught on road debris or something. It's also cable tied onto the bottom of the radiator hose and disappears up into the plastics somewhere to plug into the electricery. One thing to note if you do fit one of these extended mud guards is that any time you need to take off the brake calipers, for example, taking the front wheel out to get a new tyre put on it, you do need to undo both ends of the stay. If you only undo the bottom end, there's a chance you might uh, crack the mud guard if you've used a screw to attach the fender extender to the mud guard. As I mentioned, the rear shock does get absolutely covered, so I also bought a Pyramid Plastics hugger. The one thing is, there's this strange little ledge type feature on it that keeps water in it. This bike's on its side stand and the water will not drain. So it's something to keep an eye on. It's plastic, it's not gonna go rusty, but it's a bit annoying and I think maybe a bit of a change in the shape of it. Perhaps putting a little bit of a ramp in to get the water out would be a benefit. But it does keep the shock clear of all the muck and everything else that will otherwise get thrown up onto it. You can see here it also uh, encompasses the chain guard and does have an extension piece on the end. But it's strange that it's not molded onto it, so there's obviously a manufacturing reason for that. On the other side, and uh, exhibit number one, is that there's a hole for the brake hose and ABS wiring re retaining bracket to be fitted to it, but the hole is too large, so it can't actually be fully retained. Well, it, it stays in there, so it's okay, I guess. I've also got engine bars fitted to mine. These are called the Explorer Engine Guards by Yamaha. You come with a left hand and a right hand one. They're two separate items rather than a single one. Uh, one slight thing I've on a occasion when I've been going to the back brake put my foot slightly too far forwards and just got my toe on the engine bar not a problem just something you need to get used to and I was very glad of the engine bar when I smacked a munchuck deer and I think that the reason why I didn't get my foot hit by it is that the engine guard pushed it out of the way as I've mentioned several times, my hands are size 9 in rubber glove terms and no matter how much I adjusted the clutch, I couldn't actually use it smoothly wearing glove. Bit of a downside, I don't think Japanese people's hands are massive like Chewbacca, so I had to fork out for one of these nice little replacement clutch levers and this is on the minimum possible adjustment. So if you are struggling with the clutch and uh, when you're trying to feather it, you're on your very fingertips, I'd recommend one of these. Another thing that's not suitable are the original mirrors so I've got some 20 mil extenders fitted here my neighbor Carl who I regularly ride with has got a Tracer 900 the Mark II version whereas mine's a Mark III and he got a set of these and ordered me a set at the same time because to be honest they're needed to actually improve the view out of the mirrors you'll also notice a small Lego beaker minifigure here because I thought I'd call the Tracer beaker for obvious reasons if you're not in the UK Here's why. And as I've said before, I don't get out much. 
I have had a few small annoyances with the bike, mainly due to the finish. The first one is that on the brazed rather than welded bracket that holds all the instruments on, some of the paints flecked off. This is a well known issue with tracers, so expect this. Also get a paintbrush, get a little bit of black paint. I'm going to be using Tamiya water-based paint just to uh, touch this up as I found it useful on other bikes when I've had slight paint flecking problems. And also and rather more annoyingly at the bottom of the forks where the whatever it's called mudguard wheel brake whatever retaining bracket is fitted the paint is flecking off the top of it. Finishes should be better than this these days so I'll look at touching this up as well again with a bit of Tamiya water-based paint. A lot of this shape of bike are called adventure bikes so let's go and have a look at one of my local green lanes. There it is and no I'm not going up it on a tracer. Although if you do come across some wilder roads like this one in the Peak District it's as capable as any other bike at getting up it if you take your time and are careful. Yamaha don't call the tracer an adventure bike they call it a sports tour. So how comfortable is the tracer seat? As I said, it's comfortable for six hours in my experience. Downside is, I found that out while I was still five hours from home. It felt like I'd been caned. Lots. And not in a fun way. The sit-up and beg riding stance also offers itself to standing up to look over bridges a lot easier than some other bikes will, especially sports bikes. Going through town, especially if you're stuck in a lot of 20 mile an hour limits, you might want to put the power mode on to four rather than one because it uh, softens the throttle response a lot. Getting onto the more open roads, such as the 40 mile an hour restricted Black Mountain here, the bike will certainly swap from side to side easily enough as it will on faster, more twistier A roads. Into every life, some dual carriageways and motorways must fall, and you can chuck the cruise control on and admire the idiotic driving you'll see going on all the way around you. All in all, this was not my first choice of bike when I was looking at something about 100 horsepower that I could get luggage and everything else onto, but I couldn't find a first choice. So of the second choices, the Tracer came top, even if it is very bright red. So yes, I'll be keeping it. I've done 10,000 miles on it now, so uh, that'll pretty much stuff any trade-in value anyway. Yamaha have done away with the camo green colour for 2024, and now it comes in a black as well. And in the comments below, I'll list all the current prices for the bike and the accessories that I've got on it. If you're looking at getting yourself one of these second hand, make sure that you get the red key with it. This is very important because this is the master key that will program the other keys that work with the bike's transponder unit. If somebody's selling one without a red key, first of all ask them why, and secondly, not two grand off the price they want to replace the transponder unit. One thing to note with the lowering kit, the pegs are also 20mm closer to the floor, so if you get a little bit enthusiastic you can actually ground out the pegs. Thanks for watching, these are my personal impressions of the Tracer 9. There's lots of other reviews out there, so have a look at the rest of them as well if before you buy one, and uh, if you get one I'm sure you'll enjoy riding it. Anyway, until the next film, safe riding. Now, hands up if at about the 11 minute 10 second mark you thought I'd shut my keys under the tracer seat. Well, the edit is quicker than the eye and this is something to be careful of. If you're ever working under the seat, don't put your keys under the seat, put them in your pocket. And if you've ever drained the oil, make sure you can't put your keys in the ignition. Don't leave them in there and turn the bike on. Another free top tip service from the Vanti Rider.